I am going to move from the sublime to the mundane to give you a sense of how Asia has transformed itself in the wider context of the world economy during the past 50 years. I will begin with a historical perspective to pick up where Ron left off, uh, the beginning of the decline and fall of Asia uh, in starting 1820 and until about 1960 when Middal was writing, uh, and then turn to what I call, for want of a better phrase, the rise of Asia, beginning circa 1970, uh, and that continues. But this rise has been associated with a development that is most uneven between regions in Asia, just as it has been associated with, with outcomes that are most unequal uh, uh, between countries within regions, between regions within countries, between people within countries. Uh, and the most important lesson that emerges from this is the diversity in the development of Asia. Uh, and what I might say in conclusion is, is to learn from that uh, experience. Um, now, let me begin with the historical perspective. Uh, uh, on the decline and fall of Asia in the world economy, beginning 1820. Um, and if you were to see uh, this picture on the shares of the West and the rest in world GDP, you would see that the share of Asia, which was 56.5% in 1820, had declined to less than 15% in 1962. And this, this decline and fall was concentrated largely in China and India, which together made up 50% of world GDP in 1820, but less than 8% in 1962. Indonesia stayed at a little bit over uh, 1% uh, through this era. Now, what is striking is the asymmetry in the share of population and of GDP. So if you see the share of Asia in world population and world GDP, you see an asymmetry that rises dramatically in a period of 130 years. Uh, but in sharp contrast, you see Latin America, uh, where GDP, its share in GDP rises faster than its share in population. So this was, in a sense, the golden age for Latin America. And for Africa, where the share in both income and GDP is low, in, in population is low, uh, but it's, the asymmetry is not very high. Now, the contrast is striking if you look at the three big countries in, in Asia. Uh, you can see that the share of China in world population declines, but its share in world income collapses, just as the share of India in world population declines just a little, but its share in world income collapses just as much. Indonesia remains uh, roughly symmetrical, uh, but much smaller than both. Now, this period was associated with what has been called the great divergence in per capita incomes. So if you take Western Europe and North America as the benchmark, as 100, uh, you would see that every part of the world experienced a divergence with respect to the West. But that in Asia, uh, much more than in Africa, much more than in Latin America, uh, there was a massive divergence. Uh, so Asia's GDP per capita was one half that in the West in 1820, but less than one tenth that in 1962. And you see that mirror image, uh, particularly in China and in India. Now, in sharp contrast, hmm, the period beginning circa 1970 shows a dramatic reversal of the trends that we witnessed in the preceding 130 years. Um, and you see a catching up process that gathers momentum beginning 1990, and it continues. So if we look at Asia in the world economy, uh, in terms of its GDP and GDP per capita, you would see 
that the share of Asia in world GDP, not in PPP terms, but in current prices and market exchange rates, goes from less than 9% in 1970 to almost 30% in 2016, while its share in the GDP of developing countries goes from one half to more than three fourths. Now, this is mirrored to some extent in GDP per capita, as the GDP per capita in Asia as a percentage of that in developing countries goes from two thirds to more than 100%, and in the world from one sixth to one half, uh, although the, the, the income gap between Asia and the Western world or industrialized countries is still very large. And a bird's eye view of how the rising significance of Asia in the world economy in terms of population, GDP, and GDP per capita, if we look at the period 1970 to 2016, this comes through. Now, underlying this transformation that we see of Asia's significance in the world economy is differences in growth rates. So if you see, take the entire period, you can look at it by decades, it gathers momentum after 1990, but uh, GDP in Asia grew at almost 6% per annum over these five decades, okay, or four and a half decades, as compared with industrialized countries that grew at 2.5% per annum, or the world that grew by 3% per annum. Uh, and as population growth rates in Asia slowed down, uh, you would see that GDP per capita over this entire period grew by 4% per annum in Asia as compared with less than 2% per annum in industrialized countries and about 1% in the world as a whole because both Latin America and Africa did badly, particularly during their lost decades. Now, there is also uh, a, a concentration, there is also a remarkable, uh, what I call the great leap in industrialization on the part of Asia. Uh, you know, as a percentage of world manufacturing value added, Asia's contribution in 1970 was less than 4%. And even in, in 2000, it was a, a little over 10%. But by 2016, it was more than 40%. Now, that was, to a significant extent, attributable to China, but by no means only to China. Now, this remarkable development of Asia has been very uneven. Uh, if we were to disaggregate by sub-regions, East, Southeast, South, and West Asia, if we were to look at the GDP and GDP per capita of these regions in comparison with the world, or if we could look at the growth rates in GDP or GDP per capita in these sub-regions, or the concentration of industrialization, manufacturing value added, it is actually quite stunning how unequal it has been. Um, this is Asia disaggregated by sub-regions. You look at uh, GDP and GDP per capita in comparison with the world. So for Asia, as I said, it rises from 9% to 30%. But uh, <coughs> East Asia goes from 3.3 to almost 18. Southeast Asia, 1 to 3.5. South Asia, 2.5 to almost 4. Yeah. All of them go up, but East Asia makes the bulk of, of the increase. And if we look at GDP per capita, uh, it is even more striking uh, because East Asia had a GDP per capita in 1970 that was about uh, one eighth, a little more than one eighth that uh, in the world, and it is now about nine tenth that in the world. Uh, there was a catch up similarly in GDP per capita for Southeast Asia, which is quite significant, from 15 uh, to 40 percent of world GDP per capita. Uh, but South Asia remained the laggard in this story. Okay? Uh, so there is a huge disparity uh, in the rising shares of GDP of Asia subregions uh, and in GDP per capita levels in these subregions. 
And it is no surprise that the answer lies in the disparity in growth rates, in GDP, and in GDP per capita. So in these 45 years, East Asia grows at more than 8% per annum, Southeast Asia and South Asia both at 5.5% per annum, uh, West Asia much less, and in per capita income, East Asia at 7% per annum, uh, Southeast Asia and South Asia both at 3.5% per annum, which is unprecedented, as it were, in human history. If you look at the, the, the period in which Western Europe and, and North America uh, grew. Now, what is striking, of course, as I said, is the concentration in industrialization. Mm -hmm. uh, so you see East Asia uh, going from less than 1% in 1970 of world manufacturing added uh, to almost 30%. Uh, uh, Southeast Asia from less than 1% to 4.5%, South Asia from 1.5% to about 4%. Uh, so it is mostly East Asia, and that's China, uh, Korea, Taiwan. Uh, but it is clear that outcomes have been most unequal. Between subregions in Asia, you have a leading East Asia and a lagging South Asia, with Southeast Asia somewhere in the middle. Uh, there are growing inequalities uh, between countries within regions, uh, so that there are emerging divergences in Asia in each of its regions. And if you compare the fate of the least developed countries, there is a massive divergence ongoing. So that uh, when Francois Bourguignon was sizing about diminishing inequality uh, between countries, we need to recognize that this catch up in Asia is producing some equalization, but a lot of inequalization too. Now, this is just a striking uh, uh, between regions within countries, Java in Indonesia, uh, the eastern coast in China compared with the western hinterland, the, the, east, the west and the south of India compared with the north and the east. Everywhere there's a growing disparity between regions and among people within countries, poverty, as we saw in the morning session, is falling everywhere in terms of headcount measures, but inequality is rising everywhere. Now, this is just to give you an idea of how I, I focused on regions so far, uh, but what is striking is the concentration in a few countries. Now, you can see the share of China and world G in Asia's GDP was 30% in 1970, 50% in 2016. By contrast, the share of India in Asia's GDP was 20% in 1970, but only 10% in 2016. Uh, nevertheless, China and India are our giants in this story. Now, in conclusion, I want to say that what characterizes this economic and social transformation in Asia, I situated it in the context of the world, but if you look at it within countries, whether it's demographic indicators, social indicators, economic indicators, the transformation is phenomenal. Uh, but there is a diversity. Uh, a, it is clear that there are alternatives in development. There are no unique paths. Asian countries have followed different paths uh, to development. This has been shaped in part by their size, uh, population, uh, geography, partly by their resource natural endowments, partly by their history, partly by their context. Um, the relationship between the state and the market in the process of development has not only evolved over time in each of these countries, uh, but has been markedly different across these countries. Uh, uh, so that one size does not fit all. <coughs> the, you know, for countries that stress markets and openness, it was about minimizing market failure. The emphasis was on getting prices right and buying the skills and technologies needed for industrialization. For countries that stress state intervention uh, with different degrees of moderated, calibrated, or controlled openness, it was about minimizing government failure. 
But the degree and nature of openness also varied very significantly. There were a few that were largely open, but in many, this openness was restricted, calibrated, or in fact, very carefully managed as in the large countries in India and China. The relative importance of the domestic and external in terms of markets, resources, and technology was, was amazing. So that you had countries like Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, which relied on, on foreign markets, foreign resources, foreign technologies. You had South Korea and Taiwan that relied on external markets, but domestic resources and technologies. And you had China and India, which for a long period relied on domestic markets, domestic resources, and domestic technologies. And the diversity was just as striking in, in, the, in the governments and in the politics of Asia, which ranged from socialist countries on the one hand to near laissez-faire economies on the other, uh, but with a few democratic regimes, mostly authoritarian regimes, uh, one-party states, one-family states, and that diversity too is amazing. And yet, contrary to Mirdal's expectations, almost everywhere the state played an important role in catalyzing development. And the questions we want to ask in this study is what can the leaders, what can the laggards learn from the leaders in Asia in terms of catching up or being caught in middle income tracks? Or what can uh, leaders learn from their own past in terms of sustaining development? And indeed, last but not least, I don't have time to de develop this idea on the importance of unlearning from experience, which has been quite critical to the success stories in Asia. Let me stop here uh, and invite Will Martin uh, to comment on, on, on what we have said. Thank you.